the 10th of April, 1829, William Booth was born in this small house in Nottingham, England. The house, which is still standing, is one of a row of terraced dwellings known as Nottington Place. This street was on the outskirts of the city in William Booth's young days. But now, Nottingham has spread out and engulfed the nearby fields. In this Wesleyan Methodist chapel, at the age of 15, he was converted to that life which, in the service of God, was to lead to the founding of the Salvation Army. It was in this room, beneath the chapel, that William Booth knelt at a table and prayed. He afterwards said, I wanted to be right with God. I wanted to be right in myself. I wanted a life spent in putting other people right. Today, a plaque is set in the floor to mark this spot. In 1852, William Booth was ordained as a minister in the Methodist New Connection. This portrait was presented to him by his friends in appreciation of his arduous work in Sheffield and elsewhere. of this century, the motion picture began to come into general use, and from this point onwards, portions of our story unfold in movement. This is a typical London scene in perhaps 1904 or 5, showing a Salvationist meeting assembling outside a public house. catch another glimpse of this world half a century ago in movement. This scene shows traffic outside the mansion house in the city of London. Among the earliest motion pictures of the army's activities that have been preserved are some scenes of the International Congress in London in the year 1904. Coming out of the Congress meeting are some of the thousands who took part. The hall used was a temporary building in the Strand, specially erected for this purpose. expansion had taken place since the first Congress 20 years before. Years of consolidation in Britain and tremendous expansion in the many other countries that had been invaded by the army in those two decades. The general, accompanied by Commissioners Cadman, Pollard and Kitching, goes to the saluting base for the great march past. This took place at the Crystal Palace. The general acknowledged contingent after contingent from all parts of the world. To William Booth, taking the salute with such vigorous enthusiasm, the International Congress was an event of great importance, for he believed in associating all the races of the earth together in a common religious enthusiasm.
many great meetings were held, like this one, inside the Crystal Palace. In a railway accident in the far west of the United States, the General's daughter, Emma Booth Tucker, known as the Consul, was killed in 1903. Her death was a sad blow to him. Her body was brought back to New York, where her funeral took place. cinematograph film dealing with army history known to be in existence. The general said, she has toiled for America for eight long years, and it seems to me that she should be laid down in the last long sleep on American soil. She was buried in the Woodlawn Cemetery in New York, where a vast crowd collected. Her passing was mourned not only by large numbers of the United States, but by salvationists and their friends everywhere. The founder referred to her death as the loss of his left hand. an old man in his 75th year, yet had the courage and determination to inaugurate an entirely new method of campaigning. In the autumn of 1904, he used a motor car to tour from one end of the kingdom to the other. During this first motor campaign, a distance of 1,250 miles was covered. Imagine what this meant in these primitive cars for a man in his 70s. There were some people who disapproved of these methods, but on the whole, the imagination of the world was struck with sympathy and approval that this very old man should adopt the latest invention of science at the end of his life's work. was great. In town or country, large numbers gathered to listen to him, for by now, William Booth, who had faced great opposition for so long, had in his old age achieved worldwide popularity. His work was recognized as the work of one honestly inspired by love of humanity. Campaigning by motor car soon became one of the general's established methods. In vehicles like these, he journeyed throughout England, Scotland and Wales. The going was not always without mishaps. A puncture in those days was apparently not very easy to deal with. The general is addressing a great crowd in Wigan but towns both large and small were visited. He afterwards reported that flowers, fruit and kisses were thrown at the party and sometimes five pound notes. Now the general has stopped outside a poor law institution in a wayside village to speak to the people.
In 1905, the general set out to visit Australia, spending a few days in the Holy Land on the way. Here he is going ashore at Jaffa, where, his journal records, they were received by the cinematograph. He is accompanied by his faithful aide-de-camp, Lolly. The general's program was a full one. He visited the Mosque of Omar, built on the site of Solomon's Temple. At Bethany, he visited the house of Martha and Mary. In Jerusalem, he visited the Wailing Wall of the Jews and gave alms to a beggar. He described the Wailing Wall as one of the most pathetic scenes he had ever witnessed. He entered the Garden of Gethsemane. Here he knelt down and prayed. The climax of his visit to the Holy Land was when he climbed Mount Calvary and read a manifesto he had prepared calling on all who name the name of Christ to follow his example and make a desperate effort on behalf of the salvation of the lost world. This manifesto was reproduced in the press of countries everywhere.
I am glad you are enjoying yourself. <laughs> the salvation is to the bread of heaven. Making heaven on earth is our business. Serve the Lord with gladness is one of our favorite mottoes. So I am pleased that you are pleased. But amidst all your joys, don't forget the substance and thoughts of misery. Do you ever visit them? Come away and let us make a call of you. Here is a home. Family, they eat and drink and sleep and sleep and die in the same chamber. There is a doctor's novel, void of furniture, wife of skeleton, children in rags, father now treating the victims of his neglect. Here are the unemployed wandering about seeking work and finding not. Yonder are the wretched criminals cradling. Right, acting in and out of the prison all the time. There are the daughters of shame, disease and wrong and ruin, traveling down the dark in life to an early grave. There are the children fighting in the gutter, going up to in school, going up to fill their parents' places, brought it all on themselves, being saved, perhaps so. But that does not excuse our assisting them. You don't demand the certificate of virtue before you drag the drowning creature out of the water, not the assurance that a man has paid his rent before you deliver him from the burning building. But what shall we do? Content ourselves by thinking at him, offering a prayer, or giving a little good advice? No. Take thousand times no. We will forgive them, please them, replace them, enjoy them. Perhaps we shall fail the many, quite likely, but our business is to help them all the same, and that in the most practical, economical, and Christ-like manner. So let us aid to the rescue, for the sake of our small people, the poor next themselves, the innocent children, and the savior of the all. But you must help with the means, and as there is nothing like the rest, always this company will lend a hand by taking off the victim.